Welcome, everyone. Grab a seat. Warm up a little bit. Get close. <clears throat> um, it's great to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, you're especially welcome if this is your first time with us. Uh, my name is Matthew, and I work with the students and the youth um, here at Cornerstone. So please just grab me after if you have any questions about our church uh, or about anything you hear this morning. Um, we've got quite a lot going on this morning, so I just thought I would throw some notices in quickly at the start. So uh, these are also available on our weekly email. Um, so let me know if you'd like to be signed up for that as well. You can chat to me after about that. So just the first notice, uh, volunteering. Um, yeah, it's great to have everyone involved in lots of different things. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of different things we could use some help with. Um, this morning we had actually a really great team down and had the setup all done 25 minutes in advance, which is not the usual, but it was great. Um, but we could always use some more help. So if any of these things appeal to you, um, let me know. Uh, we also have uh, a prayer meeting on Wednesday mornings, uh, 8.15 at the Mance. Uh, it's also on Zoom if you'd prefer that. Um, and yeah, I just think prayer meeting is a great uh, time in the middle of the week. Um, to sort of, I, I love it for just sort of getting out in my own head. It's not just me and God, but it's my whole church community and their relationship with God. And also we pray for the wider world as well. So it's a great sort of um, signpost in the middle of the week. Um, so yeah, come along to that. I would highly recommend um, yeah, so intergenerational meetups, uh, if you don't know what that sort of means, we are um, planning on having a sort of one-off um, where if you're interested in meeting someone else from your church family who's maybe not of the same age as you, someone you maybe wouldn't have the chance to chat to normally um, outside of your home group or something like that, if that's something that you'd be interested in, um, we have... Uh, some sheets of paper over there on that table, and you can sign up and put your email address, and Abby Kant will be in touch about that. Um, so that's just, we just really wanted to give everyone the opportunity um, to get to know one another, maybe to build uh, a, a long-time friendship, or maybe just a one-off chat, um, see where it goes. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in that, you can pop your name down there. Um, and yeah, uh, also as part of our worship outside of Sunday mornings, um, if you're joining regularly with, with us, um, part of our worship is, is giving, uh, giving to God's work in the church um, of what he's blessed us with. Um, so there's a QR code there which leads to the website where you can find out more about how to give. Or as I say, it's, it's all on the website. Um, so you can look it up later. Um, so yeah, just as we come to sing together, um, I just want to lead us in this call to worship, reminding us that the praise of the Lord should always be on our lips. Um, and that we all uh, need his mercy every morning. Um, so yeah, uh, just say the words in bold with me. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Um, we praise God who is the creator as his created people and this song just lists um, qualities that are rather unfathomable but praiseworthy. God immortal, invisible, clothed in light in God most holy, God only wise. God most blessed, most glorious. God almighty, victorious. Present with us, yet veiled from sight. Holy is the Lord. Is the Lord 
praise you, Father God, over all creation. We thank you, Jesus, the Son, our brother. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence with us, alongside us, guiding us and reminding us of who you are, God. As we spend time this morning thinking about our absolute depravity without you, that we come as beggars or as children with nothing to offer, I pray that you will help us with the things that we are aware of in our lives where we want to be recognized, want to be wanted, or want to fit in. I pray that you'd help us to look to you and cling to you alone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, a few families have just walked in, so that's great. We were about to do a kid's song with, with no kids. Um, but in light of... The theme of today, where we are hearing a blind man called Bartimaeus shouting out, Jesus, have mercy on me. And then there's people telling him to be quiet, and he shouts all the more. This is a good service where it's probably good to push us to feeling a bit socially awkward, maybe, or feeling a bit like, oh, is it okay? Am I? So anyway, this song needs a lot of speed reading. So kids, if you're good at speed reading, that's great. I know that some of the adults certainly will be. Uh, but we'll talk about, we'll go through the chorus, and then it's a matter of trying to speed read your way through the, the verses. So can we have the chorus up on the screen, whoever's clicking? Um, should we do it in B this time? <coughs> Did it in the wrong key last yeah. service, but the band all just adjusted. <coughs> um, so it goes, God's love is big, God's love is great, God's love is fab, and he's my mate. How does that sit with you? Yeah, but it's true. Um, it is important that Jesus receives us and we receive him. But to those who are looking to him, Jesus says, I call you my friends. Then God's love surrounds me every day. And I love to sing and say. Then it's the same tune. God's love is big. God's love is. God's love goes and on and on. God's love Counts me every day, and I love to sing and say, comes the good bit, God loves me. What does that say, Tommy? Where at the bottom, the bottom of the screen there, the exclamation mark, that's it. God loves me. What do you think it might sound like? What rhymes with me? Where he... Putting your family on the spot here, Thiago. Sorry. <laughs> so it's God loves me. Where he... So there's the, if, you get, if you're struggling, you can always hit that bit. All right? Jared, do you want to come? Do you want to... No? He's good. Okay. <laughs> here we go from the beginning. The earth, the sun, the moon and stars Has a place in his heart for me From the beginning to the end God will always be my 
Here we go. God's love is big. God's love is great. God's love surrounds me every day. And I love to sing and say, God's love is big. God's love is strong. God's love goes on and on and on. God's love surrounds me every day. And I love to sing and say, here we go. Began. God knew me and had a plan for my life and how I'm going to be. He sent Jesus to be my friend, to show his love will never end. So I can jump and shout because God loves me. God's love is big, God's love is great, God's love is fab and he's my faith. God's love surrounds me every day. And I love to sing and say, God's love is big, God's love is strong, God's love goes on and on and on. Love surrounds me every day, and I love to sing and say, God loves me. So then there's a bridge, and you just have to kind of shout words. God's love is big, big, yep. God's love is great, great. God's love is fab. God's love is strong. God's love is big. God's love is this one great. God's love is fab. God's love is strong. Let me just shout those words so it's big, great, fab, strong. 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 Big, God's love is big, God's love is great. And I love to sing and say, God loves me. Well done. Let me pray for the children. They are soon to head on to their activities. Lord, we pray for everyone here that we might enjoy the diversity that is found in the different ages. Lord, for those who are older, may they be invigorated and challenged by those who are young. For those who are young, may they look with hope to the older that they may have wisdom those who have followed you for longer or lived life for longer. But Lord, most of all, may we enjoy you together, recognizing that you are with us every step of the way. So may these children learn as they spend time with their leaders and the helpers, and may we learn as we spend time here too. May we all be learning of you by your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yeah, so baby crash at the back. This baby crash, second crash in the bar for the preschoolers, and then it's downstairs for the other primary age children. Yeah, just while they're heading out, uh, if you'd like to turn and welcome and chat to someone you haven't yet, that'd be great. Hopefully you can continue those conversations later on. Um, but just now, um, 
Yeah, Duncan's going to come and chat to us in a minute. Um, but yeah, we're going through the, the Gospel of Mark, and something that I love about Mark is that we have this journey Jesus is on with his disciples. He's meeting and interacting with them. He's meeting and interacting with people along the road. This morning, we're going to hear about Bartimaeus um, and his interaction with Jesus. Um, and I was listening to a song in the car last night that was talking about um, how our God that we are praying to is the same God of Jacob, of Moses, of all of these characters in the Bible that we know and love, um, and of Bartimaeus as well. The same Jesus that Bartimaeus cried out to is the one that we cry out to as well. And so I think it's great to hear, um, as well as studying the scriptures and seeing these people interacting with Jesus, it's great to hear um, of our own experiences and of people in our community and how they've uh, come to know Jesus as well. So Duncan's just going to come and share a little bit of his story. Morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, for those who don't know me, my name is Duncan, and I'm a fourth year geography student here at the Uni in St. Andrews. I've been asked uh, just to share a little bit of my life, especially focusing on a time where life's challenges paled as I realized my need for God's grace and salvation. So for a bit of context, I grew up in a Christian home, um, attending church and youth group uh, each week, but wasn't particularly interested or inclined to read the Bible and felt that a surface level of Christianity suited me just fine. It always seemed easier to conform to my parents' wishes than challenging them, so I didn't really think much about church or faith, but just went along with it. Coming to uni then was a bit of a shock. All of a sudden, I had my own decisions to make about who I spent time with, what I did, and what I believed. I soon joined the hockey club, <coughs> and somewhat apprehensively attended my first few social uh, events. I'd heard rumours of a forceful, alcohol-intense culture, and unsure on where I, my thoughts were on faith, I hedged my bets. This meant I refused to follow older members' instructions, which certainly didn't earn me any friends, uh, but I still wanted to be involved and accepted, so I would partake in some things. I was, I was picking and choosing what I wanted to do. Um, so I was in a halfway house, committed neither fully to the guys in the club or to my loose, fairly loose faith. Yearning for recognition and acceptance from my peers, I struggled on that first semester uh, trying to balance the expectations of everyone around me without explaining to anyone why I was hesitant to fully commit to their lifestyle. In hindsight, I think I was lacking a secure identity in a new place full of new experiences, but I didn't know how to achieve that security with conflicting thoughts on church, faith, and the desire to be accepted by others and to fit in. The best I could do was to live an outwardly good life, attending church uh, while struggling to internalize Christianity in my pretty inconsistent life. Uh, where are we? This, however, wasn't satisfying, and after Christmas, I met up with a friend uh, to talk about how I felt completely unconnected to God, even though I described myself as a Christian. Following this, I started to read the Bible with more intention to try and understand why it was that I actually went to church. Uh, this left me feeling like a fake who pretended to know God, but didn't know how to fit him into my life. I began to try and reconcile how to live as a Christian with the challenges that faced me in my activities and my social groups. However, I was still struggling to see the need, uh, my everyday need for God until one particular hockey club event came around. This was a sort of initiation into the club proper and involved a series of moderately unpleasant challenges around town before finishing up in a flat where we each earned our club shirt. I sat on the floor in total silence with my peers, afraid of, of what others and senior members would think and be saying about me um, one by one, people left the room, and I felt less than human. I, I had nothing left in me. I, I'd been, had my identity stripped away from me that night um, as I lost my dignity for the sake of this T-shirt. I'm walking home uh, with a friend. I broke down in tears, angrily questioning why this God I thought I was coming to know had failed to help me in my desperation. I was upset that I hadn't somehow managed 
to convey my new faith to those around me, despite not actually saying anything about it to them. I realized then that I couldn't just pick and choose when to have God in my life, and, um, and that I was crying out to him desperately. Um, but implementing that realization isn't easy, and there are still times where I put too much faith in my own strengths or achievements, or in the desire to receive accolade from others. So while this wasn't the end of my journey uh, of learning to rely on God, my everyday need for his salvation and grace was made very clear that night uh, when my world and my strengths were stripped away from me. Thank you. We pray that he might be of benefit and blessing to others as he testifies to your help and your provision. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand and sing. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. The city of our God, the holy place. The joy of the So let's take a seat. Shall we pray together? This morning, as we think about um, the blind man, Bartimaeus, calling out to Jesus in his need, we still ourselves. We acknowledge, Lord Jesus, that we need you. Forgive us, Lord, for our pride. Forgive us for our belief that we can sort it all out ourselves. We come before you humbly. And we thank you that you are a God who is slow to anger 
and abounding in love. And Lord God, as we um, think about being able to see and we think about the things that we see in the world and experience through our other senses, we look at the world and uh, we thank you, God, that we see an amazing world that you've created. We thank you for how the amazing diversity and intricacy of that world reminds us of your beauty, uh, the one who created it. We thank you just for how the scope and the size of this universe reminds us of your awesomeness as a creator God and we want to praise you God for that. And Lord God, as we uh, sometimes look and see in our world and experience through other senses, Lord, small acts of love, Lord, just uh, shown uh, between people. Lord, we pray that there would be acts of love shown through our congregation um, and our church fellowship to one another and beyond it. And we thank you that in these small acts of love, Lord, we see an echo of your love and your character as a God of love. We see an echo of uh, the love that you have for every one of your children, Lord Jesus, in that you, you lay down your life for us. And we thank you. We thank you, Father, for this town. We thank you for the ways that we see you at work. We pray that you would... Be with those within our community who are ill, who are struggling for various reasons. Lord, would you comfort them? May they know you with them, and would you sustain them? Lord, throughout our community, would you be at work bringing hope where there is despair and restoring love where there is broken relationships? Show us the roles that we would play in your kingdom purposes here, we pray. Thank you, Lord, for the CU Events Week that took place last week. We pray that you would continue to work in the hearts of those who heard your word, heard of you maybe for the first time, that you would be drawing them to yourself. And we pray, Lord, for Kenny as he goes to speak at the Events Week in Dundee this week. Lord, that you would speak through him, that you would give him the words that you want to say, and that you would be at work in that place. And Father, we pray for the work of one of the works of our church this morning, the Mums of Preschoolers group that is just started up again. Lord, we pray that you would provide practically for all of its needs, including the volunteers for this week. And we pray that you would bring the mums that you would have there and that it would be a place where they feel seen and heard and encouraged in their role. And Lord, that they would catch a fragrance of you and want to know more about you. Father, we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom to those in authority and that you would raise up leaders who would humbly serve. As we look at our world, Father, we so easy to feel overwhelmed by all the needs. Father, would you show us how you are at work and you'd show us how we can be part of your kingdom coming would your people across your world be light in the places that they are we acknowledge it is your world and that you are at work thank you lord so let's finish by saying together the prayer our savior taught us and you can see the words on the screen I'm just going to suggest we say this a little bit differently. Let's pause for a few seconds between each line to perhaps reflect on what we're saying to God. I'll try and give you the keys. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we have also forgiven those that sin against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Let's just pray before we read. Our gracious God and Father, thank you for your word, which is living and active. We pray that as we read it, you would give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation to know Jesus better, and that you would enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we may know the hope to which you have called us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first reading is from the Old Testament, and it's Lamentations 3. Chapter 3, verses 19 to 26. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is then cast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And the New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 10, verses 45 to 52. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks very much for joining us this morning. Um, Is the live stream still on, Hannah, or is it? No, it's gone. Okay. We can do whatever we want now. No one can see us on the internet. Um, Yeah, we're having problems with the live stream, um, so I was going to apologize to the people watching online, but no need to apologize now. They're gone. Um, Anyways, uh, yeah, if you're visiting or if it's your first time here, it's great to to have you with us. Um, We're going to talk about a very serious topic um, to get started. Uh, I grew up as a... um, My father was a minister, and uh, the, the, the first thing people ask anyone who knows anything about church, if they meet someone whose, whose parents were in ministry, is, you know, do, how do you feel about church now? Because it's extremely common for people who were, whose parents were in ministry to be extremely negative towards Christian community and church because you see all of the worst aspects of what Christians can do to one another and the way Christians can act, the way that religious community can go profoundly wrong. And in a sense, I think that dynamic has been a part of Cornerstone from the beginning. Not that I'm saying hopefully we embody all of those bad things, of course. But the idea that in every home group I've been a part of for the however long, nine years I've been here, we have had people that are trying to sort out, can I still have faith? Can I still believe? Um, Despite all of the ways I've experienced Christian community to be profoundly harmful, hurtful, whether it's, it's experiencing cliques, or experiencing 
what are sometimes called hierarchies of value, where some people are considered good and religious and moral Christians and others are excluded or judged or rejected as bad, or whether it's even worse, whether it's abuse, tribalism, judgmentalism, and the list could go on. So from the beginning, this has been a community of faith where people are trying to figure out, despite what has been done to me by the church, is Christianity still believable? But at the same time, I've also seen another reaction to that dynamic. And that reaction is to say, if Christian community can be this harmful, and this to use the word, which I will use going on, that is very popular right now, if it can be this toxic, if it can have all these dehumanizing relational dynamics, then maybe the solution is just to get a different sort of community altogether. And so sometimes people come to a place like St. Andrews and they're looking for a non-religious community because they think the problem is religion. And sadly, what I think often happens in that circumstance, I've seen a lot of times, for example, people have that attitude about academia. And they get into academia and they think, I'm going to find my community here. And those of you that have been in academia for very long don't need me to tell you that tribalism, hierarchies of value, competition in-group and out-group cliques are just as present there as in any fundamentalist religious community. See, the problem isn't religion. The problem isn't church. And lots of times, that's what people will think. Oh, we need, you know, maybe they think, even if they're still religious, they think the problem's just church. If I just get in a kind of a, a group of people in my house, that will somehow save me from these dynamics. But it won't. Because the problem is humans. These dehumanizing, toxic, relational dynamics, whatever you want to call them, they crop up whenever humans get together. And we start harming and hurting one another. Just, just to hammer home this point one more time, that, that I think it's a misunderstanding to think the problem is church or religion. The problem is much deeper and more wide. I wonder if any of you remember what this was. Yeah, some of you do remember. During the beginning of lockdown, a number of celebrities got together. So this is when lockdown was kind of just starting, and so in a sense it was at its worst. People were isolating. The pandemic was, in, was going full stream. People were, there's a mental health crisis around the world going on. And so a bunch of celebrities got together, and they said, we know what we do, we'll do to help everyone. We will make a video singing John Lennon's Imagine from our mansions where we are isolating, and we'll put it on YouTube for the poor people and that will solve the world's problems. And the reaction, if you remember, was absolutely vitriolic to this thing. I love, I'm gonna, this is a magazine called Slate from the US. It's a left wing, not religious magazine at all. It says a video of celebrities singing Imagine so bad it can bring us all together in hatred. And this was the opening line. It's nice to see everybody come together in a time of crisis, and for once, regardless of age, gender, race, faith, or political party, we can all agree Gal Gadot's video of self-isolated celebrities singing Imagine is one of the worst things to have ever happened. <laughs> but there is something rather naive about this, isn't there? Because the way Imagine goes is, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. Basically, the point of the song is, if there was no religion, there would be no conflict in the world, there would be no problems, and everything would be solved. Imagine the naivete to say if people just stopped believing, they stopped having faith, the pandemic would go away, the mental health crisis would go away, and all of the ways we harm one another would suddenly evaporate. The problem isn't religion, it isn't church, it's the basic human condition that something about us makes us fall into these tribal dynamics that harm one another. So what I think this passage does is it is Jesus' solution to this problem. The reason I say that is baked into the passage is this issue of uh, sort of religion gone wrong, religion used in dehumanizing ways. This poor blind beggar cries out for mercy and the people around him rebuke him, silence him, and tell him to shut up. Uh, one of the most well-known theologians and church leaders in history, John Calvin, from centuries ago, says this about that verse. It's rather shocking. 
It frequently happens that the greater part, the majority of those who profess the name of Christ, instead of inviting us to him, rather hinder our approach. (laughs) It's a shocking claim. He's saying the majority of Christians will make you want to not believe that Jesus is the Messiah because of the way they treat one another. It's been a problem for centuries, going back to the very beginning. And what Jesus offers in this passage is an antidote, a solution, not only to the way religion can become dehumanizing and can go wrong, but more provocatively still, he claims, I think, to provide the only antidote to the way that humans, more broadly, have a tendency to dehumanize, to harm, and to hurt one another. And what that antidote is, and this might sound like it's going to be nowhere near extreme enough, but we're going to unpack this as we go on. What his antidote is, is conversion. If you've been with us going through the Gospel of Mark, you'll know that in Mark, there's all of these miracles. And every miracle, as we've said before, is not just about the physical thing happening in that moment. Every miracle is a lived, enfleshed parable. It's a physical representation of some spiritual reality that applies more broadly. And what I want to argue is that this parable of the healing of the blind beggar is an enfleshed version of what conversion is meant to be. It's a physical parable of what it means to truly convert. And even more provocatively, it's Jesus' contention that most of the people around him, which claim to be his disciples, haven't really experienced conversion. The reason I say that is that, here's a, here's a few reasons. There's a bunch of features of this miracle which make it unlike any other miracle in the Gospel of Mark. One, it's the only parable, or it's the only miracle, miracle parable, you get my point, where the man who is healed, where we know his name, in every other parable, we don't know, or a miracle, keep saying it, we don't know their name. And the reason most scholars think that is, is because it's assumed that the audience Mark is writing to, the early church, actually knows this man. They know who he is because he is a member of their community. This is the story of him. And by the way, Bartimaeus, a lot of scholars think that name actually means son of the unclean, someone who is unclean, rejected by religious society. This is the story of how someone went from being unclean to being a founding member of the Jesus movement. It's a paradigmatic story of conversion. Further, some of the other things that separate this about any other uh, of the miracles is the way that it ends. In every other uh, miracle, uh, what, what happens at the end of the story? The person is told, uh, now go back to your own home. Right? To, and, and the other thing that has happened is it says, tell no one. The end of every one of the, the miracles is he says, don't tell anybody about this and go back to your own home. Jesus doesn't do that here. He does the opposite. Why? Well, if you've been with us through Mark, we've talked about this a lot. The reason he doesn't want anyone to tell what happened is because up to this point, he is afraid that people won't understand him. That people will misunderstand who he, Jesus, is and what the content of his mission is, what the gospel is. Now, for the last two chapters, what Jesus has done on three separate occasions is tell people exactly who he is and exactly what he's there to do. He said, I'm here to give my life as a ransom for many and to rise again. In other words, the reason that this man can tell people is because he is the first person in this whole story who has actually explicitly heard the Christian gospel. This is, in Mark's gospel, the first Christian, explicitly Christian convert in history. The first person who actually has the opportunity to respond, to respond to the gospel that is explicitly given, and that's exactly what happens. It says, your faith has healed you. That word actually means your faith has saved you. The, the word literally is just save, and it can mean physical saving or spiritual saving, and Mark is playing with that intentionally. To say this physical salvation is a representation or image of a spiritual salvation. And instead of going home, where does the man go? Along the road. The literal translation is just along the way, which is a technical term for discipleship. If you're a disciple, what it meant to be a disciple is to be one who goes along the way with your rabbi. Everything about this story is screaming, this is what it means for the first time to truly convert. So then what are the features Mark is trying to get us to see? 
What does he want us to understand about conversion that all the people around him are in danger of missing? Well, Jesus, the, the way Mark sets up this scene is rather ingenious. Um, what he's doing is he's trying to contrast the blind beggar with two other false or failed conversions in the same chapter, in chapter 10, which if you've been with us, we've been talking about in the last few weeks. He uses the exact same expression, literally word for word, that was used a few verses earlier when Jesus was talking to the disciples. You might remember this scene. We just talked about it recently. Two disciples come to Jesus and they say, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, we want to be at your right hand in the kingdom. We want the best place in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus uses the exact same question for the blind beggar. In both instances, he pretty much knows what they want. <laughs> in the first instance, he's heard them arguing with one another. In this instance, there's a blind man begging to be healed. He's already heard that. He pretty much knows what he wants. What he's doing is he's, he's contrasting. If you are truly converted, you come to Jesus wanting the right thing. The wrong thing to want is something that will separate you from others. That's what the disciples were wanting. They were saying, give us something which will separate us from the other people in the kingdom, which will allow us to feel that we are superior or that we own something which makes us different or unique or special. By the way, this is the foundation of all of those toxic relational dynamics we talk about. Give us something which allows us to know we are the good people and they are the bad ones. We are the true Christians and they are the false ones. We're on the inside and they're outside. In contrast, what does the blind beggar come wanting? By the way, he still comes wanting something. The point isn't True conversion means you don't come to Jesus saying, help me. You come saying, I want to worship you, or I want to serve you, or something like that. No, everyone comes to Jesus wanting something. But what Jesus is inviting and what he's longing for is that you would come like the beggar, saying, have mercy on me. Saying there's nothing about me that makes me deserve it. There's nothing that makes me owed it. He is longing simply for grace. And this is, by the way, contrasting him with another figure from the same chapter. Because there's another false conversion. We talked about it just a couple weeks ago. A man comes to Jesus that we know now as the rich young ruler. And the whole point of the story is that he can't let something go. And that stops him from converting. On the surface, what he can't let go is his wealth. Jesus says, leave behind your wealth and come follow me. Come on the way and he's clinging to his wealth. But as we said when we talked about that story a couple weeks ago, actually what Jesus is doing is using his attachment to his wealth to reveal that he's holding on to something more deeply. Because when he came to Jesus, he said, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? He's hanging on to this, this, this conviction that he can be good enough, that he should be accepted by Jesus, again, because there's something about him that makes him better, superior, more worthy than others. And notice Mark adds a striking detail, intentionally contrasting the blind beggar from the rich young ruler. Because what does the blind beggar do when Jesus calls him? He flings his coat aside. He does precisely what the rich young ruler wasn't free to do. A cloak for a beggar was the most valuable item you possessed. It was what protected you from the elements, is what you would hide under in long, cold nights. And when Jesus calls him unthinkingly and without inner conflict or turmoil, he throws it to the side because he's so longing and intense on the only thing that he believes will give him joy and satisfaction and life, the grace and mercy which comes from the Messiah. What this is suggesting is that many of us have fundamentally misunderstood, whether you're religious or irreligious, whether you're a Christian or not, we have fundamentally misunderstood what it means to convert. And part of the way you can get to the heart of that is this. Where are we supposed to locate ourselves in this story? Who are we? Who are you and I? Sometimes we're the crowd, and we need to ask that question. Sometimes we are the ones that are perpetrating that unhealthy dynamic, that are harming others and pushing them down and pushing them away. Sometimes we are blind Bartimaeus on the way, 
You might feel, and that's true if you're a Christian, sometimes you've been converted, you've been changed, you're now walking on the way with Jesus. But the main space you are meant to locate yourself if you're a true convert is in an ongoing, lifelong movement of throwing your cloak aside and beginning to be given sight. See, many people think that conversion is something that happens in a single moment in the past. The Bible sometimes speaks that way, but not usually. Usually, conversion is not a moment in the past. It is an ongoing state. Here's a few examples. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to we who are being saved, it is the power of God. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, or most strikingly for our purposes. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul begins making very clear he's talking to Christians, to holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. In case you missed the point, he spends 16 chapters going through every single blessing that those who are in Christ receive. He says you have adoption from the Father, you've been chosen in him, you have forgiveness from the Son, you have new life in the Spirit. He goes on and on and on and on. And then what's Paul's prayer for these Christians that they might begin to see? I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. In other words, he's saying, you're still blind. You're in this ongoing movement of receiving grace, of throwing aside what entangles you and holds you back and draws your heart away, and of beginning to see yourself for who you really are, perhaps even more importantly, so that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. In other words, that you can know how good and sweet and beautiful and power the grace which you are freely offered really is. The reason I think this is the key, the key solution for those relational dynamics we talked about at the beginning, is because what this is saying is if you are truly a Christian, if you are truly one who finds yourself in that movement of conversion, if that is not something in the past but is your daily experience, then you have nothing, nothing at all. No works, no goodness, no righteousness, not even your conversion, which you can use to leverage, to place yourself above, above others because it doesn't belong to you. It's a gift you receive freely day by day. This is one of my favorite hymns, and I think it expresses it beautifully well. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. To be Not just someone who was converted, but who is converting in the way of the blind beggar is to say again and again, day by day, nothing, nothing at all in my hand I bring. And to come to him saying, have mercy upon me. The theologian Karl Barth put it this way. The Christian will not suppose that he has his faith as if it is his possession which makes him different or better or superior, but he will hope and hope and hope for it as the Israelites hoped afresh every morning for the manna in the wilderness. And when he receives this faith afresh, he will also daily activate it anew. Mark has done something powerful in setting up this scene. Because what you expect is that you are going to see the person who is in the most dire straits uh, in the whole gospel. We're seeing a blind beggar who's excluded by the followers of Jesus, who's rejected by them, who's outside the gates, and who seemingly has nothing. And yet notice who he's contrasted with. He's contrasted with a rich young ruler who is the most powerful and has the most resources of anyone we've met in the gospel and yet we find out is completely a slave. A slave trying to convince some inner voice within him that says you're not enough, you're not enough, you're not enough, that perhaps somehow he could be good enough. And then we see the disciples. The people who are on the inner ring. These are, these, this is not someone from some other religion. This isn't, you know, maybe, maybe the Pharisees, we could say, oh, they're, they're outside. This is the most core people in the Jesus movement. And what are they presented as? Slaves. 
trying to find a way to prove to themselves that they belong by begging Jesus to give them the best seat. The man that we initially expect is on the outside that has nothing, is the richest man in the whole gospel. The only one who is truly free. Free, so free that he can throw aside his prized possession without a thought. So free that when the crowd around him screams at him to shut up, what the gospel says is he begins shouting all the louder. He's free from possessions. He's free from the expectations of other, uh, others, and he is living his life purely longing to receive grace. I don't know if you're totally unlike me, but that sort of freedom sounds incredibly liberating. It sounds incredibly sweet. It sounds like something that is so far from my daily experience of longing to convince myself that I'm good enough or that I'm in, on the inside or that I'm not a failure. And therefore, what Jesus invites us into today whether you've been a Christian your entire life or whether the first time you've heard this message, what he invites you to do is to be converting, to be coming to him with empty hands, saying, do for me what I cannot do for myself. And this table, by the way, this table all throughout the Bible is descri- and baptism are described, it's described as a table of salvation. Now, that might make you nervous. This is described as saving. But the point is, again, salvation isn't a one-time thing from the the past. Conversion isn't a single moment that happens. What this table tells you is who you really are. Who are the two people that in Mark 10 are presented as paradigms of those who truly receive the gift of Jesus' grace? Children and a beggar. Why? Because there's two groups in society that are so helpless they cannot feed themselves. What this table tells us is that Christ offers us freely as a gift, again and again, day by day, freshly, every morning, what we cannot attain on our own backs and labor. And so you are invited to receive that gift again. You are invited to take that posture of the blind beggar and to say, have mercy upon me. Not because of who I am, not because of what I've done, but because of the free gift which is offered to us. Come to this table. Not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and long to love him more. Come come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Let's take a few moments to prepare to come to the table. Hear the words of the institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. If this uh, is what you are clinging to, would you join me in saying these words in bold as we profess our faith together? 
Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon these, your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread that we break and the cup that we bless may be our participation in the body and blood of Christ. Speak to us afresh and anew of what we cannot do for ourselves. Offer us the mercy and grace which we can never attain or deserve, but which we are offered again and again purely as a gift. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You're going to be released row by row if you'd like to partake. This table is for those that are trusting uh, in that gift for themselves. If you'd rather not partake, you're very welcome to just remain seated. Um, As you come up the middle aisle, you can sanitize your hands and someone will offer you bread. And there's wine on the two outer um, trays and non-alcoholic juice in the middle. And there's also a gluten-free option. Um, As you come to the front, you can just partake right here and throw your cup in the bins. Um, could I ask Vic and Trey, would you guys come help me serve? Which I, I never got anyone to help me serve, sorry. Um, and then we'll also be singing as we come to the table. So Matthew, just wait until your row is released.
be covered by your grace so free here I am knowing I'm a sinful man covered by the blood of the The greatest love of all is mine since you laid down your life. The greatest sacrifice. Majesty. God, we thank you for your word in scripture. We thank you for your work in Jared's heart and life as he's engaged with you this week. And we thank you, Spirit, for the things you've been placing on our hearts as we've listened. Most of all, we thank you that we don't have to come and pay. We don't have to come with lots of riches or cleverness or social um, power. So help us to be humbled that we might actually be free. And we pray also that you would use us as agents of your amazing work in other people's lives um, for your purposes of freedom and wholeness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you brought children with you, if you could collect them now, that would be great. And then you can come back and join us as we finish this last song. my 
reward and all of my devotion now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy through I've decided, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, I have decided So as we leave here and head into the rest of our weeks, let me just send us out with this blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great rest of your Sunday.